as a as a young, young person coming up or pursuing your education. How was it? Was it uh, uh, everything rosy or did you really encounter some challenges? Were you from the family? How did you manage? No, I come from a very humble background. Um, wasn't educated. So the best we did, he did, was funding to support us. And as children, it was our responsibility to support the livelihood of the family. And we did that. And today I look back on that, and it's one of my most joyous days. In fact, up to the time when I was a teacher training at ZTI, I would go home. Those days we would have the long vacations in um, late November or early December when school closed. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, and then um, at some point, I would even be able to stay home, depending on the vacation and the farming season. I would stay home up to the time the planting is ready. You know, then I would leave the family to work with it, and I could go back to the to the to the, to the uh, school or teacher training. And I did that like every year, every year when I was coming up. Um, I also. In my education, uh, teachers discipline students. We had no janitors in the school, so students were the janitors. So we had set schedules. Every last Friday of the month, the whole school was involved in general cleaning after the first three periods. So the women, the girls would bring brooms, they would bring holes, the boys would bring cutlasses and whatever. And every student had a portion to clean. And by the time we finished, the school compound was very, very clean. And that was repeatedly done every month. Uh, the other thing was tidiness. Being punctual and on time for school was very important. We were on the line. We called it on the line to hurst the flag, the national flag. Mm -hmm. By 7.45 and by 8 o'clock we would have devotion in the public school, we would have devotion and, uh, and a student who came after the flight was hosted was given a punishment and it could range from a few latches to, you know, a portion to claim in the school compound or even hot sand or rocks depending on what was necessary at the time. But those discipline were done with a lot of love from the teachers. They wanted to make you a better person. They work hard to really put you on the path for success. Were you involved in the social activities too? Oh yes, we would be involved in social activities. I mean, um, there were schedules for like what we call school dance, okay. uh, sports. I mean, I grew up playing volleyball and later on basketball. If I had the opportunity, I would have, you know, gone on to play basketball at the national team level, volleyball at the national team level. But uh, when I finally came down to Monrovia, especially for university, I mean, life was very tough for me. I didn't have the opportunity. I didn't even have a place to stay. Uh, <clears throat> I remember when I when I came to Monrovia to go to university, I ended up going to stay in West Point, not that it was the worst place in the world, but I had to stay with a boy who had lived with me when I was teaching. Okay. And when I came because I didn't have any place to stay, so he took me in and he was living in West Point. Those days, uh, these commuter buses around town, uh, they were 10 cents. You get in anywhere and you stop anywhere, it was 10 cents. I could not afford 10 cents to ride a bus. And many days I would walk from West Point to University of Liberia to school. Stay in school all day and didn't have anything to eat. If I didn't have 10 cents to ride a bus, you know I didn't have money for lunch. What, what, what were actually your motivations? Did you really have a thought that there, was a, there, there would be a light at the end of the tunnel? What I'm telling you about my background was we were taught that you were made to succeed, you were born to succeed. So, in fact, when disciplinary actions were taken, 
for families. The question was, it wasn't just you who was being disciplined. It was like your parents have fought it somewhere. And that's why you were showing this indiscipline. So that motivation to always genuinely succeed was very high for everyone, my group, my age, and my upbringing. Especially as a young man, we were taught the best success was you had a good character, people admired the way you live in the community, you contributed positively to issues of development in the community, you were polite, respectful to every elder, and I mean, it was, it was, that was the kind of things we competed about. Um, life was, you know, I, I look back now and life was very good at that time. Yeah. It was tough. It was harsh, look, apparently. Because if you didn't really do that, and you didn't tolerate that, and there were a few people who didn't think they should go through those rigor. And today, if some of them are still alive, I look at them, they wish they could uh, be different. Life is so tough and rough with them. They're so backwards and really, really underprivileged in society. And that's not where they would like to see themselves. And now, uh, fast forward, how did you manage now today? You are now occupying, occupying one of the bigger portfolio in, in the society, in the Labyrinth society, managing conflict, conflict transformation. Uh, how is it like? Well, <clears throat> first, I don't see myself as occupying a position. I see myself as serving. Uh, when I when I when I did teacher training, mm -hmm. the obvious thing would have been to go through, you know, to continue to be a teacher. But something affected what became my change in career. At a very, uh, I was in the fourth grade. There was a program then called the Full H Club, which was an agriculture uh, program in schools where students were taking it practically to do agriculture. And I just developed very high interest. The way this man presented it, the motivation he gave us, we were in the field, we were working, we were planting, but there was so much joy in it because he always told us there was good. Uh, 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 output at the end of the tunnel for this, and so um, I was, I was, I was really motivated by that, and I thought, I, you know, wanted to do this. So as I grew up, my interest continued in it. So when I came to the university, I wanted to go into that science. So my first degree was in uh, wood science and technology, where I trained to do saw milling. I trained to do plywood production, I trained to do paper making, uh, ceiling tire making, you know, we call them chip boards, uh, various kinds of uh, wood paneling and wood decoration, everything about the nut and bolts of wood, I studied it at a master's degree level. I completed my master's at the University of Wales and got back in this country December 23, 1989. We know what happened December 24, 1989. Mm -hmm. The war broke out. Some of my suitcases were not even unpacked when they were taken away. And when I saw the intensity and the level of the conflict, I thought I needed to stand up for something. But uh, we'll come there. But uh, what actually brought you home by then? Uh, especially one day, the next day, the war. Why, in fact, having acquired such an education, why couldn't you stay up there and just uh, make life? Why you choose to come from? That was in me. That's not the nature I have. First, I had an obligation. Okay. Uh, I had signed up. I was going to go and complete, and I would come back. So I was coming back to honor my obligation. That's one. Two. Uh, my entire family was here, my mother, my father, my sister's brothers, my wife, my children, we're all here. And uh, I didn't take them for, you know, higher education when I was going. But besides that, there were indications that things were amiss in this country. Being honest, I knew all the details. No, I didn't. 
but if I had known all the details, would that have deterred me? I'm not sure. Because when I got back mm -hmm. and saw what was unfolding, mm -hmm. friends were everywhere calling me, can you get out? But I didn't decide to get out. Because I said to my friends, if you want me to get out, you need to send 150 tickets. And they said, stop this joke, please get out. For all of your family? Yes, because how would I get out of here, leave my mother, leave my father, leave my brothers, leave my wife, leave my children, you know, I mean, cousins, nephews. I mean, so I just thought, what it is, let it be. We would all go through this together. And so, like I said, you know, um, I just I just decided we would stay and work through it. Yeah, and I stayed. I came back because I was motivated to come. I wanted to contribute to the country. Let me tell you, um, right on the back there, you will see the thesis I wrote for my master's. Liberia has one of the largest single rubber, the world's largest single rubber plantation in Liberia, Firestone. Rubber wood, after they have finished what you call their productive life and producing the text. The wood itself has a utility that has enriched countries like Malaysia, Singapore, and uh, other countries. They convert that wood into very, very high quality export material. I went into you know, use my previous uh, skills in conflict management and psychology and went to do peace studies and that's how I got into where I am and then um, today we have an institution fully accredited that is offering this level of uh, qualification in peace studies. Okay, as a, as a director of uh, the Kofi Annan Institute of uh, Conflict transformation. Tell us what is your role and responsibility here. Hmm. I have very few responsibilities here, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I tell people what I do here is the janitorial. I'm in the bike, like cleaning all of the bits and pieces that drop along the way. Figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> but. <clears throat> The Kofi Annan Institute has three major, major functional areas. One is research. The institute is an, is, I mean, it's an institute of research where we do research primarily on conflict and conflict related areas. But we want to know, this is, Liberia is going through all of this difficulty about managing the conflict. But this is not the first conflict in Liberia. There were several civil wars in this country, inter-tribal wars of all sorts. How were they settled? What were the mechanisms? How did people come back together? These are things we are researching so that we can see whether they can be applicable to bringing people back together after violent conflicts. The second thing we do, you know, I like to tell people, African leaders are developed by their own people into being detectors. What do I mean? In the absence of clearly defined functioning public policy on issues, a lot of us Africans bring our traditional method over all knowledgeable on everything concerning the society. So we bring that mentality into our mainstream politics mm -hmm. and that person becomes the president. So because we don't have a policy on science and technology, everything relating to science and technology, what does the president say? We go to the president, mm. and the president makes a decision. Everything relating to health, we go to the president because we don't have a health policy. So what does the president say? 
everything relating to education, everything relating to infrastructure. So if I am this superhuman who knows the last word on education, on science, on technology, on health, I gotta be a superhero. So a lot of African leaders groomed by their people end up becoming detectors because there's so much attributed to them. But if as a country, and we do have some policies here, but some of them are either dormant or some of them are too archaic for the stage we are in as a nation. So we try to revisit, we bring policy makers and you know, policy users into forums, we call them public policy dialogues, and we discuss, like we're talking, I mean, after a better civil war like we fought in Liberia, there will be a need for a robust reconciliation. We do have in this country an instrument that we have titled the Reconciliation Roadmap. The question is, you as a journalist, how many times have you heard about the Reconciliation Roadmap? Have you seen it? Hmm. No. But there's a reconciliation roadmap that has been drawn up by this country. What is needed? One, is there sufficient public participation in the development of that roadmap? What do people want to see in the process of reconciliation? What is it that people want to be reconciled about? Because we could be talking about oh, somebody who killed my uncle or somebody but I'm here, my uncle is dead, my auntie is dead, but I'm here, I need to live, I need to be able to develop myself, I need to build a future. And there's nothing addressing that. I end up being a zogo on the street. Then you're talking about reconciliation. Reconcile what? So we need to be able to bring to light some of these policies, revisit them, crystallize them, make them more functional. So that's some of the things we do in public policy. And of course, sitting in the university, we have curriculums where we teach. We teach. And our curriculum is built, we call it four levels. We have the master's degree program, we have the postgraduate diploma, we have the certificate, and we have what we call the outreach. And that's the biggest component of our teaching. And that has to do with after school youth, youth leadership, community leadership training, training in mediation, negotiation, training in community empowerment, training in gender, training in peace and security, training in peace and development. We go around various communities based on the needs and these are the kinds of trainings we do. Because people in those communities are never going to have the time to come here for a six month certificate or nine month diploma, not to talk about masters. But they need skills. They need to be able to handle the issues that confront them. So as an institution, we go out to some of those places and we do these kinds of capacity building. So we call that our outreach. And of course, we keep very faithfully to the curriculum which has been approved by the university, and we offer those courses. Okay, uh, let me bring you to this question. You are also an allocate, but there are more, there are more people in West Africa, especially the rich, straight to labor, that feel that labor students cannot compete with the West African counterpart. Do you hold to that perception? No, I don't. Hmm. In fact, I think Liberian students are better than many, many, many students in Africa, world, I mean Africa continent-wide. And I know that because during the period of the war, I had an opportunity to go around. I was you know, involved in some of the support services that supported refugees around the West African region and getting Liberian students, for instance, into some of these institutions. Initially, it was like a blockage. And that's because Liberia alone is a tiny little here as the American pattern. And most of the other places are more like British or, you know, other systems. And so the comparison, people right here in Sierra Leone didn't even understand 
when you say I'm a high school graduate, what does that mean? Are you talking about 2-1, two, 2-2, one, two, two, you know, first class? I mean, we don't have enough of that in our system. So when you take your paper out there, you're in a different world. So it was difficult for Liberians who became refugees in some of these neighboring countries to enter some of the institutions. But after a long battle, when they finally began to admit Liberian students, mm -hmm. it became clear these were diamonds. Liberian students who have left from here and gone abroad to study have mm -hmm. come out flying colors. Even under our current education system during the war, there have been Liberians who have graduated through these systems and have gone out there and have come out flying colors. The worry I have about our education system are three basic things. Number one, which is the primary. How do we strengthen our teacher training institutions so that they produce the quality of teachers that can bring about the transformation we need? Two, how do we move our education to the regular rudiments? Chalk, uh, this, we have to be able to bring some improvement into our education system. Is it possible today for children to be able to have toys that are educational? Is it possible today for children to be able to spend their recess in things that are recreational but give them some education. We know the challenges, we know the obstacles, and I will come a little bit to elaborate that. But even at the tertiary level, you have students who do not even know how to operate a computer. Students come to graduate school and tell me they don't have an email address. These are not a product of our education system. They are a bigger picture of our national challenge. And we need to deal with them from that level, not just educationally. We need to deal with that from a national level. Um, I don't know if she will want me to call her name, but let me just leave her name since I don't have her permission. But a principal educator in this country Yes, of experience, far, far more than I do anyway. Went and wanted to establish an educational link, primary education link, with one of the rural schools because they are running a very good, I mean, well functioning primary school. And they wanted to do like a sister relationship with a rural school where they could build some linkages so that what the children are doing here could be done in the rural area. This honorable educator traveled miles into the jungles of Liberia, went to a district, whatever we call it, the electoral district, and then the children sitting on mud blocks, and the teacher was using charcoal to write on the board. Wow. Running a class from what we call ABC to sixth grade with three teachers. One of them had gone to wherever to run behind their salary, which was, you know, not coming for the last four months. They had these two teachers running a school from primary to sixth grade. You compare that with the representative from that district riding a $75,000 Toyota 4Runner. Mm -hmm. Do you know what 75,000 will do if it were put in the education system of that district to build the facility to train Liberia's future? So when I say we need to look at the days, changes in our education from a national standpoint, these are some of the things I'm talking about. We need to know where our priorities are. Where are our priorities? And how are we demonstrating that? Because one thing to say, oh, this is important for me. But money 
is where your mouth is, right? Or your mouth, where your money, wherever you put it. If we say education is important for us, that's where we build the future of this country, we must be able to support it. Okay, Dad. Let, let, let's get back to your professional life. We you know it's sometimes difficult to reach a certain level. But reaching at this level, what do you think what do you think is, is is challenging for young people? Most often we see young people fighting each other. One may say when young men is at their level, one of the young men is fighting each other. And other people believe that the young people in Liberia is not really prepared to to take over leadership. Do you think what, the, what is the cause of young people fighting each other? Well, the first thing, if young people are fighting each other, I would say to them, don't fight each other. Mm -hmm. um, like I told you, when I got my first degree, it was a good science and technology, and the challenge was I wanted to go out and get a job. At the time, Bummy Wood in Bummy Hills here had just started a factory, the company had started. And I saw an opening there for a job at the time, 1982, for 700 US dollars for a car and a house. And I thought, phew, super. So I went and did the interview. I passed. And I was ready to go for the job. Came. Packed my bundle and went. And then the German mellow said, Oh, we can't take you. I said, Why? I scored the highest in the interview. My name is all over. They said, The university says they want you. I said, No. Not me. I never even applied to the university. I don't want to go there. I don't want nothing to do with university. But the man said, Well, I have told you what I'm saying. And he walked away and left. I walked behind this man. I said, maybe he goes in his office. We can sit to talk. He never was willing to talk to me. I stayed to that place. Three days endlessly. No effort. So I came back to the university. Then at the time, my department chair, this beat was actually a Ghanaian who was a victim of the Liberian Civil War. Died on the border with his whole family. He said to me, he said, the kind of score you did here, we don't want you in industry. You need to come to the university. We need to develop Liberians to take over in this university. At that time, there were a lot of Ghanaians and you know, other nationalities. Department chair, deans, a lot of other nationalities. Liberians were not around to do it. And this, there are no war. I'm telling you about what we call normal time. So, but to be honest with you, thinking about that money and you know all that that could do for me. But the long and short is I accepted. And I started. Was this smooth and rosy? No. Under the program of the university those days, if you were recruited as a TA, teaching assistant, the normal period was in two years, you got some experience, and you were sent abroad to go and do your master's and come back. All of my colleagues who were myself graduated, all of them left. I was stay there. I kept asking, nothing was happening. I spent five years as a TA. And a young person would have thrown the tower in and gone somewhere and decided to. I didn't. One day, a colleague of mine told me, oh, they have foreign scholarships at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I said, let me check. And then when they used to have these things on the bulletin, I saw this, and I applied. And so I applied to that particular profession group. When the results came back, they said I was the only one who was selected. And that's how I ended up in the UK at the University of Wales, the second most prestigious university in the UK. What I'm saying is, if you 
commit to excellence, you don't have to fight nobody. Mm. Go to the Ataisha. The mm. louder speaker takes the day, right? Of course. Okay, Dad, before we take leave of you, but the case of perspective on other, other issues, like looking at our, our general education system, how do you look at our secondary school system? Let me go on record for this. Hmm. The current minister is just yesterday a professor of this university. Hmm. And we saw the first pronouncement I heard from him mm. was that he was bringing in 6,000 foreign teachers mm. to permeate the school system mm. while we do something about retraining our teachers. Mm. I said to you, mm. I'm one of those who are very supportive of that. Mm. Supportive. Very supportive. The mechanism and the how we needed to have worked on it. And they are giving me a suggestion, and they are giving me the chance. I had my own suggestions. Mm -hmm. I was very supportive of that. If we need to change the standard of our current education, we need to do it radically. Mm -hmm. If we have the kind of teachers we have in some of our schools, even around Morobia here, the qualification of people who we have in our classrooms don't need it. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to change. No matter you leave that guy there and he be attending some night courses, it's not going to work that way. The guy needs to be pulled out. We need to have a competent person there and train this guy and cycle him back into the system. If we were to do this with the support of broad or even maybe further afield, recruit teachers. If 6,000 is our, I don't know the statistics, but 6,000 is our limit, mm. we recruit the 6,000 teachers maybe broadly mm. so that they come with the specializations and get into our classroom. We screen our teachers and tool them, retool them so that they are better prepared in a year, two years, three years. I'm not saying we are perfectly there, mm. but under the Salif administration, there was what they call this top 10 mm. and senior executive service programs and what have you, where people came from wherever, broadly. The top 10 was for Liberians, you know, um, transfer of technology or transfer of knowledge through expert national. They come and they were given the right incentive and they entered the civil service and they did what they were supposed to do. What we didn't benefit from during that time was the places these people were, we needed to have been training people, Liberians, so that by the time their term ended, two years, three years, we would have this person ready to come and step in. Mm -hmm. That's what we didn't do. So a lot of these people, their service, their whatever ended, a lot of them left, and almost like we are back to square one. We need a serious, serious reform in our civil service. We need a building. We need capacity building. We just need a reform to translate our entire civil service. And the same with our education. The same with our health. The same with many areas of our national life. We do need to wake up. And we need to wake up radically. We need some changes. Thank you, Dad. Before we take leave of you, finally, there was a report. <laughs> there was a report recently about when uh, sixty thousand uh, Liberians youth who are into drugs, taking drugs. You being an educator and a father, also, what would be your kind of advice to those who are following you now and maybe listen to you later on? Um, drugs is not just being a father. Mm. One of our research is on national security. Mm. We are working a city 
security agencies, the AFL, the police, the LIS, and NSA, and what have you. We do in service trainings for some of them. And we are doing research intensively in the communities on how to improve community security relations. Hmm. And one of the challenges over and over, I've been to Grand Jida, I've been to Vaughan, I've been to where, member all over this country. Our children, our young people, our future, who are most affected. Because mm -hmm. some of them, it might be greed, it might be a lot of arrogance, but some of them is innocence mm -hmm. that is luring them into this. And when that thing shakes your brain out, rehabilitation, forget it. It's a danger, mm -hmm. a serious danger. <laughs> Drugs has money for a few people, but even those people who are getting that money, they fail to know that what the drug creates as a disaster in the community they will not enjoy the money they are making from it. Let them go and ask the Americans. Mm -hmm. Today in America, if you go to if you go to some of the police reports in a city like New York, one day the homicide record may almost be like our three four months record here. One day. And most of this is drug related. There used to be a place in Washington, D.C. called the killing capital of the world. That was the place where the highest I mean, homicide cases took place. And most of it was associated with drugs. And our people need to know this. Drug is dangerous. It's lucrative puts money in the line in the pockets of some people but it endangers the community in which they will use that money and the answer of course is no you leave your country and go somewhere because everywhere is almost getting to the same challenges we need to work on the issue of drugs and we need to do that drastically thank you very much sir that will be before we take leave of you what will be your final message to viewers and people who have been following you um, I want to be grateful that my life can be featured in, 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 in the media. I'm not frequent with this, but I want to say to people, even from a humble background, maybe at some point when somebody calls you a nobody, Mm -hmm. In fact, I forgot to tell you, there was one time one of my colleagues, one of my classmates, had to sell his extra old set of uniform to me just so I could have a change of uniform. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I was in the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. I was not regular at wearing shoes up from thinking that things are so bad, what's the use? There's a future. If that future doesn't come immediately today, give it a chance. The future will come once you are prepared. Okay. Thank you very much. That was the voice of Professor T. Demba City, being spotlighting her activity and contribution to the growth and development of Liberia. Thank you very, very much, Professor, for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay. I've been Kelvin Tikat, anchoring this edition along with my colleague, Mosey Quenu and Benjamin Johnson. Have yourself a pleasant day.